There's a race of men that don't fit in, a race that can't stay still. So they break the hearts of kith and kin and roam the world at will. They range the field, they roam the flood, they climb the mountain's crest. Theirs is the curse of the gypsy blood, and they don't know how to rest. If they just went straight, they might go far. They're strong, brave, and they're true. But they're always tired of the things that are, and they want the strange and the new. They say, could I find my proper groove? What a deep mark I would make. So they chop and they change, and each fresh move is only a fresh mistake. And each forgets as he strips and runs with a brilliant, fitful pace. It's the steady, quiet, plodding ones who win in the lifelong race. And each forgets that his youth is fled, forgets that his prime is past. Till he stands one day with a hope that's dead in the glare of the truth at last. He has failed! He's failed! He's missed his chance! He has just done things by half. Life's been a jolly good joke on him, and now is the time to laugh. He is one of a legion lost. He was never meant to win. He's a rolling stone, and it's bread in the bone. He's a man who won't fit in. I saw this place for the first time back in 1964. I remember I was 11 years old, and I was a tenderfoot member out of Troop 50 in Roanoke, Virginia. I, <laughs> I remember it was the first time in my life that I'd really been thrown out into the wilderness without any adult supervision whatsoever for an extended period of time. I mean, we had a scoutmaster, but he was old and slow, and I was faster than some kind of a 13-legged reptile. I was also highly nocturnal. There's a pretty good chance if you looked at my cot at 2 o'clock in the morning, you would discover that I was out here in the lake catching bullfrogs with my teeth, or maybe standing on the roof of the dining hall, butt naked, and screaming at the moon. I was entirely insane and crazy. I was a new member of the Bat Patrol, and for some reason I was given the camp astronomy tent. This tent had so many holes in it that you could lay in your cot at night and look up and see all the major constellations and planets. Sputnik would come zipping by every once in a while. Bats and whippoorwills and bald eagles could fly in one side of the tent and fly completely to the other side and never touch a piece of canvas. It was kind of a miracle. This was nearly 60 years ago. I remember that every morning after breakfast, my scoutmaster would scream at me. He'd say, Hankins, go to your second class instruction area. It's up by the chapel. But instead, I'd stick a fishing rod down my bridges and I'd run out through the woods and I would hike about five and a half miles up Max Creek. I'd spend the whole day fishing in those deep crystal pools way back in the woods, catching native trout. Most of them were about 10 inches long. But every once in a while, you'd hit one over a foot. Some of the most beautiful fish that God's ever put on the earth. I do remember catching rattlesnakes when I was that age. I was only 11. I had the brain of a gopher. I was entirely crazy. I used to catch rattlesnakes and I'd play with them. I'd give them names. But I knew better than to bring them back into camp because people would have thought I was crazy. Boys, I was crazy. I was completely out of my mind. I do remember that on the first day of camp in the late afternoon, the scoutmaster came to me. He said, Hankins, we have given you gopher duty. When you hear the big bell up on the dining hall going off, and you can hear it through the entire valley, when you hear that bell going off, I want you to run as hard as you can and go to the dining hall. And a nice man up there is going to tell you everything you need to know about being a gopher. I was an idiot. I thought a gopher was a big amphibian that lived in the woods eating raisins all day. I had the brain of a grilled cheese sandwich. 
However, when I heard that bell going off, I ran at high speed up to the dining hall. I walked in the door and I found myself looking, I can still see him, at a 17-year-old tyrant. He was a dictator. He was the living embodiment of Adolf Hitler. I've never seen anybody like this in my life. He didn't speak English. He spoke some kind of broken German. He had a little weird nose coming out. I mean, a little bit of, of a mustache coming out of his nose. Looked like a caterpillar had crawled up on his lip and died. He screamed. Everything he had to say was coming out at a high-pitched scream. It was horrifying. I couldn't understand a thing. Luckily, he did a lot of gestures with his arms, and he was pointing at a table over in the far side of the dining hall. you got to remember that 60 years ago, this was the dining hall up here on the hill where the trading post is now. Over in the corner of that dining hall was a big old table, four by eight and it was covered up with plates and cups and bowls and something they called silverware. People, the silverware was red. I kid you not, it looked like it had just been dipped in fresh human blood. Red, nasty looking, because it had been washed for 20 years in manganese and iron water. Oh, it was terrifying. I was sitting there looking at it. Now, there was eight people at each table. And I had to figure out how many plates and cups and spoons and forks to put on that table. There was a lot of math involved. I was moving one spoon at a time. My methods made Adolf particularly aggravated. He came over and started screaming at me in a high-pitched voice in some kind of a pure German that nobody could understand. I got all my tables set up and everything was fine and all of a sudden one of the cooks stepped out of the kitchen, and he said, Come get your bird! Oh my God, they're going to make us eat little birds! This is terrifying! I didn't know what to do, but I ran into the kitchen, and there I found myself looking at a 13-foot-tall man named Leon Harvey. This guy was the most frightening individual I've ever met in my life. He had butcher knives around his belt, had a pitchfork, and he had a small caliber handgun that he kept in his in the apron. He was ready for anything. Leon's job was to make sure that everybody got a fair amount of food. They handed out fried chicken, some kind of lima beans, and they gave us what they said was mashed potatoes. It sure didn't look or smell like my mama's mashed potatoes, but I knew better than to complain about it. Three kids had already been shot for complaining about the food. Don't worry, they weren't dead. They were just stacked up over by the dishwasher, kind of bleeding out a little bit. They would never walk normal for the rest of their life. I carried the food back to the table, and I put it right in the middle, and as I looked out to the left, I could see there was a vast crowd of humanity out there getting ready to come in. All of a sudden, some idiot walked up to the double doors, and he screamed out, Come and get it! I've never seen so much running in my life. The rumor was if you didn't run, you didn't eat. So all these idiots came charging into the dining hall. We were standing there at our little tables, and a man on the far side of the building stood up and got everybody very quiet. And he uttered a blessing. He said, Dear God, help us live through this meal. Amen. It was a non-denominational blessing. Now the boy next to me was responsible to make sure that everybody got a fair amount of food. He was supposed to load the plate and he'd pass it around, and that's how it worked. Eventually I'd get some food. He did not understand that concept. He didn't know how that worked. Across from me on the other side of the table was a big old farm boy, probably weighed about 1,500 pounds. I can't remember his name. We just called him 1,500-pound kid. When the chicken came past that boy, he'd reach out with his hands and grab it and just slam it into his mouth and swallow it down. He didn't even chew it. He just swallowed it completely whole. It was like watching a wolverine eat a penguin. It was terrifying. So eventually, by the time the plate came around to me, there was no food on it. And all these idiots started screaming, go get food, go get food. 
We'll kill you if you don't get food. Go get food. Boys, it was terrifying. I took those serving plates. Somebody had taken a bite out of one of the serving plates. I took the serving plates back to the kitchen, and I walked right up to big old Leon. He was standing there. He was only slightly smaller than Godzilla. I walked up to him, and I said, I need more chicken. I want beans, and I want some of those terrible mashed potatoes, and I want them now. Leon took two steps back, and he shot me twice in the left arm. I deserved it. It was justifiable homicide. It didn't kill me. It was just a flesh wound. In fact, as I looked at Leon, I could tell that he actually kind of liked me. Otherwise, he would have shot me graveyard dead. I carried my food out to the table. They did a little bit of first aid on me. They put some mashed potatoes on my arm to slow down the bleeding and to kill the bacteria. I carried the food out to the table and I threw it kind of right over in the middle of the feeding frenzy that was going on in Troop 50. I've never seen anything like this. This was like watching 200 great white sharks eat one baby seal. Blood and screaming and yelling and people passing out on the floor. It was some spectacular action. I was watching all this going on and suddenly I heard the most terrifying thing you can hear when you're a gopher. Desert! Desert! Man, I turned around. My soul actually left my body for a minute as I turned around and tried to fight my way through that mob of gophers to get to the kitchen. I saw one gopher actually fly 95 feet through the air using nothing but his elbows and his kneecaps to sail to the kitchen door. You would have thought they were giving away gold bars and bags of diamonds, but it was nothing but this old nasty burned yellow cake. Leon had gone out to his car to get some more ammunition, and somebody had let the cake get burned. It was bad. Hey, I brought it back to the table, and it went around. 1,500-pound kid ate five pieces. I didn't get any of it. I'm assuming it was pretty good because they were eating everything on the table. They ate the napkins. They were chewing on the spoons. Finally, when the meal was over, somebody stood up and sang the Camp Power Tan song, and they let us go. They said, everybody but the gophers can go. It was still some daylight outside. So I sat there looking at a pile of just yellow crumbs and bones and napkins and pieces of trash, and I didn't know what to do. The Nazi came out and started screaming at us for about 10 minutes. Nobody had any idea what that idiot was saying. So I walked back to the kitchen, and they gave us a number 10 can. It was an old rusty can. It had about three and a half inches of water in the bottom of it. And in the bottom of that water was a black rag that had been used during the Civil War to mop up the blood of dying Confederate soldiers. They've been using the same water for the last three and a half years. I used that to kind of clean up the table. If you had taken medical grade smallpox and Ebola and diphtheria and hydrophobia and put it in a little cup and drank it, it would have been safer than one drop of that Camp Power Tan cleaning fluid. <laughs> Boys, as I stand here tonight and I scan this crowd, I see faces that are probably not there. I hear voices from long forgotten conversations. I see Mike Kennedy up in the back talking to Buddy Baker. Is John Ectonaut a funny hat? Steve Shad smoking a cigarette. John Hurley, Orville Gates. Carbon and Eagle Feather, Bill Gibbler, Bob Rasmussen, Roy Page. They're all here tonight to hear John Hankins tell one last story at Camp Palatine. To shoot one last flaming arrow out across this sacred space behind me. And so I am forevermore haunted by the memories 
of the man I used to be in this place, this spectacular place, this remembered place that came along at just the right moment in time. Thank you.